Okay, so the continuing saga, I guess it is, <laughs> of community. And I'm just going to do a little mini recap for just to help people that weren't here last week. Um, last week I shared that while washing a strainer full of black beans, the Lord dropped the two words, build community, into my spirit. It was, I said, just a simple two-word mandate. And so I, I, but it came with such a that I knew it was something that he want, that he was speaking and something I needed to really pursue. So I started, you know, reading things and reading the scripture and reading articles and um, just studying it out. And, um, and then finally I committed to John that I would preach on a Sunday morning. And then 10 days later on Friday, October 17th, God spoke to me while I was in the shower and said, if you build it, they will come. And I t told you last week that I recognized that line. Um, I knew, you know, like Field of Dreams. It's from Field of Dreams. And so um, I knew then that I went to uh, YouTube, but it was actually a full day later because we were in the midst of Awakening Cry. And so I went, the, went and watched that clip on YouTube and found out as I told you last week, that it's one of the most top 10 uh, most misquoted lines from movies. That the line is not actually, if you build it, they will come. The line is actually, if you build it, I will come. Or he will come. Excuse me, he will come. The Lord was saying it to me. And so uh, I knew then, first of all, I knew from the first part that God was speaking that he would if we were faithful to build community, that he was going to bring a harvest or an influx of people in, but that that was dependent upon us building a greater sense of community. And then when I found out that the he in Ray Kinsello's cornfield or whatever was actually not Shoeless Joe Jackson, as you were being led to believe the entire movie, but that it was actually his dad his father, then I knew that also God was telling us that if we would build community, they would come, but when we were faithful to do what he asked, that he was going to show up with a power and just a, a, just a presence that would be intensified in our sense of community. I shared the definition of community as a united body of individuals living in a particular area with a common characteristic or interest living together with a larger society. It's a body of people or nations having a common history or common social, economic, and political interest. It's a joint ownership or participation. And then finally, in summary, I told you that we at Zion, we must pursue being a learning community. That means that we're continually growing and sharing and that that is, a, that is a really important part of our group dynamic, that community um, experience is also to play a major contributing role. We also need to work together and be a celebrating community. Christians need to have fun. In fact, Christians should be the people having the most fun in the world, not the people that are in the bars chugging down shots Seeing how happy and who can take the most, that is not happiness. Christians need to exhibit true happiness, and that is what people will be drawn to. Um, we need to have emotional connection. It's very, very important. We also need to function together as serving and loving communities. And those last two areas are where I'm going to spend the bulk of my focus today. So a key to building Christian community is to be a loving community. If we want people that are far away from God to be attracted to our loving Heavenly Father, they need to see that we love each other. We need to demonstrate in a way, our, the love, in a way that displays how much He loves us. This should be a draw to every non-believer. 
Instead, it's often the very thing that turns people off to the church. Instead of seeing a loving church that's accepting and warm, they see a group of people that are judgmental and condemning. So paramount to this love culture being displayed is that we first have to understand how much Jesus loves each one of us individually. We have to know it, we have to embrace it, and we have to reflect it. Many of us take on that conditional human form of love and try to understand God's love for us through that. God will only love me if I, or I did this today, and so surely his love has, you know, diminished. But that is not the way the love of God works. There are many, many broken and hurting people there out there that need to experience the love of God. When we reflect how much God loves us through the example of Christ, we will be motivated and empowered to love our brothers and sisters in the same way. So we need to truly understand how much God loves each and every one of us, how much he loves you personally. Do you truly understand, do you believe that God loves you? And so, being the wonderful children's pastor that I am, I have props. <laughs> I need uh, two assistants. Brian, if you would gather that, you'll be assistant number one. And let's have, um, well, let's have Ethan. Come on up, Ethan. Bring that on over here, Brian, and you can stand just right up here with that, and, and you can turn it around. No, the, <laughs> the other way. So what we truly have to understand, so Ethan looks into the mirror, and Ethan, do you know that the love of God is inside of you? All right, but some of us look into the mirror and we don't see the Lord's love. Okay, first turn around. We don't see the Lord's love inside of us. We don't know. We know, we know like maybe mentally the Lord loves me, but we don't embrace that, that the Lord loves me. He picked me. He loves me best. You know what? All of us should say that to ourselves. The Lord loves me best. That's what the Lord, I mean, the Lord says that. He picks out every one of us and says, I love you the best. I love you the best. Because he loves all of the, us the best. Because God is God and he can have lots of bests. All right? So you are a shining star in his kingdom. Do you believe that? All right. You are also, Ethan, filled with his joy. <laughs> All right. So the here in here it is. So he is loved by God. God loves him the best. He is a star. He is God's shining star in the kingdom, and he is filled with joy. So all of these things are in each and every one of us, but when we turn and look into the mirror, do we see it? Do we see it? Because we will only reflect what we see. All right? So if he turns around and looks in the mirror, do you see it, Ethan? What do you see? Uh, a heart and a star and a hat. And they stand for? Love, star, or star yeah. from heaven, and joy. The joy of the Lord. All right. But many of us can have these things inside of us, but when we look in the mirror, we don't see any of them. So that's where we need to start with is before we can really be an effective community, we need to embrace those things for ourselves. We need to be a people that hears the word, believes the word, and reflects the word. All right, you can take those to your seat if you want. I think there's too many Christians that know the word, but they don't reflect it. 
So practice that in the mirror, in the morning. I have the love of God inside of me. And you'll feel it. Surely you won't see the heart come stick on you. Well, maybe some of you will. And the sombrero of joy or whatever. But we need to, we need to believe what we hear. We need to believe what the Lord speaks to us or we'll never be effective. We'll never be an effective community if we don't first all individually grab and hold on to. Ephesians 4 verses 1 through 3 gives us some guidance towards how we reflect the love of Christ. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We are to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And each and every one of us is called to live a life that glorifies the Lord. Live in a manner that commends or puts God on the A-list. God needs to be seen in your life, in power, in strength, in love, in peace, in all of his facets. Those reflect through you to a world that's looking for those kind of qualities. Humility. A lot of times we hear that word and we instantly think, lowly minded. I mean, for some people, Eeyore might come to mind. It doesn't mean that you think less of yourself. Jesus didn't walk around saying, I am a nobody. That was not in his spirit. He was not humble and didn't walk around telling people, I am a nobody. He, that was not what humility meant. Obviously, he proclaimed the truth. Instead, it means that you think less of yourself when you are around others. You think less of yourself when you're around others. We must be positively other-centered. Des delight in discovering others and serving them so that they reflect progress. Think about the humility of Jesus displayed in the Gospels. He cared about and served the broken and the hurting. The washing of the disciples' feet is a great demonstration of that humility. I think that's one thing that was so attractive um, to, I think most of us when the team from Bethel came was that they ministered from such a sense of humility. There was nothing that in them that said, you know, I'm further along than you or I've arrived or I'm, I'm a better than you or we can prophesy better than you or there was none of that. They ministered from a place of humility and it was very attractive to all of us. Philippians 2, 1 through 9 says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. The next portion from that um, section in Ephesians talked about the Lord and his gentleness. And the word for gentle is praoutes. And praoutes is not a weak, powerless expression. Instead, it means to be have active strength, under control from a working purpose. In fact, the ancient Greeks, they say, called their war stallions under the control of their masters, praoutes, the same word. So here you've got a powerful stallion, but when under the, under the controls or the reins of his master or rider, there's a gentleness because he knows how to direct and um, move that horse. Gentleness in the Christian community is knowing how we wield the power of God under his direction to have a healing and transforming impact. Think about the potter's hands on the vessel that he's shaping. That's a perfect example of gentleness. As the, the wheel is spinning and the potter's got his hands on there, you know that just he's got the lightest touch 
and he's shaping. At any moment, he could push hard or he could smash, but the hands are gently shaping that vessel. The Lord is gentle with each and every one of us. Likewise, we need to be gentle with people around us. A lot of times we get a new person that comes in and we got them on the wheel and we're shaping them and it's like, you know, we just want, we want a rapid, perfect vessel, which we're never going to get, but, but we want to apply pressure. We want to at times just go, oh, you're not working, you know, smash the gob of clay. But we need to have that picture of gentleness where the hands of the Lord are just gently shaping on the wheel. That's the kind of gentleness that we need to have. Be patient. Oh, everyone loves this one. That means be long suffering. <laughs> this is where many of us can lose it. We, we have expectations for arrival. You know, that somebody's going to arrive at a certain point, that they're going to get to where the Lord but really us, thinks they should be. And so long-suffering is linked to making allowances for other people's faults. It's developing a tolerance, but not a tolerance that the world today says that we need to have, and that I affirm you and however you behave is right for you. Not that kind of tolerance, but tolerance that says, I'm going to accept you, I'm going to move towards you, even though I don't quite agree, or I'm annoyed, or I'm hurt, or disappointed. Any of those emotions can enter into our patience factor. But in that tolerance, we're, we're moving towards the person, and we're accepting in our patience. A big key for loving is to deepen our own appreciation for how Jesus loves. The more we can focus on the love of God, the more we will naturally glorify God by loving people the way he loves them. I read this scripture last week, but I'm going to read it again uh, today. It's from 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8. And just as a side note, this was on our wedding invitation, <clears throat> on the front, in brown ink, on ivory paper. Uh, be beloved, <laughs> Let John doesn't remember any of that. <laughs> beloved he said he remembered the scripture he didn't remember the rest of it beloved let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love and this verse is refer referring to agape love which is the undefeatable disposition to do good, unconquerable goodwill that always sees the highest good in the other person. Our natural inclination many times, especially if we've been upset with that person, is to look on them and see all their faults. Not to look on them and think and minister to their highest good. Agape love is a self-giving love that gives freely without expectation of return. Again, that kind of goes against our manipulative nature. Agape love is a love by choice, based on our will, not our emotion. Because many times, there'll be times that we don't feel like loving somebody, but we, in our will, because the Lord is working through us, we love them despite everything. That's what's going to build community. John 13, 35 says, By this all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So let's look at a few more keys to building community. And I'm going to use Romans 12, if any of you want to turn there. Romans 12, verses 9 to 21 are going to be where we go for some guidance today. And even though many of these scriptures are addressed to the individual, I think they have a lot of impact on community as well. And I'm going to read it first, and I'm going to read it from the message. 
Um, I read it from uh, the English Standard and New American, but then when I read it from the message, I thought this really makes it very plain, as the message often does, although sometimes the message makes it almost too plain that it doesn't almost seem biblical anymore. But this one was pretty good. So uh, verse 9, starting there, love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil and hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with happy friends when they're happy. Share tears with them when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. So I'm going to break some of this down into um, sections. Verses 9 and 10 talks again about addressing us about the love of Christ. That message comes from the core of who we are. You notice in the message that the instruction there for humility is that they said, practice playing second fiddle. We've already talked about the importance of being loved as related to building community, so I'm going to explore some of the other areas further. So verses 11 through 13, don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians be inventive in hospitality. Don't burn out. That's an important part of community. Keep yourself fueled in a flame. As a learning community, we should be constantly growing. When there is no growth or fresh water, things can get stagnant. So think now about the contrast between power and intensity and the excitement of the fresh running water, like maybe being down at Riverfront Park on Mother's Day when the river is running fast and furious. And there's just, even though there's so much power and all of that, there's still a refreshing that comes. Or now think about walking by a pond that's still and stagnant and has an algae film on top and stinks. One is attractive and therapeutic, and the other one is smelly and repelling. So which one do you want to be? <laughs> I would choose to be the active, attractive, therapeutic, healing. I want all those things to flow out of me. And that comes from my growing in the Lord continually. If we ever think we fully arrived, and we get satisfied with the same O or what's, you know, yesterday's bread, then we run the risk of becoming stagnant. And with that stagnance becomes also the smelliness that comes along with that. And we can pretend everything is, you know, we're awesome and everything, but when we're not growing, that attracting factor is no longer there. So I urge you, if you're not plugged into a 242 group, excellent place to experience growth and learning. Uh, come on Wednesday nights. Annie spoke two weeks ago, and Zara spoke this week. And awesome. Both words were awesome. In fact, I told Zara later that sections of what she said and um, 
parts of the video that she showed, I had been working on my message that day, and it was parts of it seemed almost verbatim when, to the part on the love of God. And so you want to be here, want to grow? Come and hear from other people. Uh, this week, exciting, Sean Edwards is bringing the word. So you're going to want to be here and hear what the Lord is speaking to him and showing. So Wednesday night is an awesome time. Come and get plugged in. Be alert to the Father and to his voice. Expect him to talk to you. I think a lot of people come to church and figure, well, when John talks, then I'll hear what the Lord's been saying, but you don't ever seek his voice for yourself. He will talk to each and every one of us. Obviously, he's giving visions to children in the night. He wants to speak to us as long as we are open and receptive and asking him. He will come and talk to us. Stir expectancy and anticipation. Cultivate a happy heart. All of these actions are attractive and they're contagious. Bees are attracted to happy colors. You know, when you wear a bright yellow shirt or an orange shirt, the bees come around you. If you're wearing a black shirt, nothing against wearing black shirts, but if you're wearing a black shirt, usually the bees are not near as interested in you. So non-believers will be attracted to naturally happy, excited people. That doesn't mean that everybody has to start wearing yellow and orange. That's not what I'm saying. But that was just that there, that attraction that when we have a happy heart, when we have the love of Christ inside of us, it will be attractive in the same way that the bees come to those colors, the lost, people that are hurting, people that are broken will start coming near. Look for ways to help your brothers and sisters. Be a blessing. And blessings don't always have to come from monetary sources. Yes, there are needy people that do need, you know, food and water and clothes and a home. They're, and I'm not discounting that. We do, people do have those needs, and we do need to be ready and equipped um, spiritually and financially to meet those needs. But I'm talking about words of encouragement, and your time. Sometimes those are exactly what a person is looking for. We can minister to our brothers and sisters in need with just a word of encouragement. Take time. Talk to people. I love the next part where it says to be inventive in hospitality. So I looked up inventive and it says having the ability to create or design new things or to think originally. So you don't have to do hospitality the way your brain thinks hospitality has always been done. When people think of hospitality, their minds automatically shift to having somebody to your house or inviting somebody to a meal. Instead, hospitality refers to the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, and strangers. I think we can sometimes get caught up in the entertainment portion of what hospitality means and not remember that it also has to do with reception. For a church community, we need to be a friendly and generous receiver. We need to have a reception. People feel welcome. They feel like we're friendly. That's a big portion of being hospitable. Are we, are you, welcoming? Do people feel welcomed and accepted in the church? Are we inclusive or exclusive? Here could be a big problem. We love each other. A lot of us really, really love each other. In fact, some of us love each other so much that when we come to church, that's who we want to spend all of our time with. We go and connect with our brothers and sisters in Christ because we like to be around them. We get together in small groups on Sunday, oftentimes right in front of the door. Um, and we stand there, and we're visiting with our friends. Oh, I hit something there. Uh, often with our friends, and we're talking about, you know, what happened in the week and just catching up because we love each other. But we have to be careful to not become cliquish. We're so focused on ourselves and our group that we are not 
hospitable to people that are coming in, or even to people who've been coming for a while but haven't connected to somebody yet. A key component to building community is to building inclusiveness. Do we try to keep new people, or do we try to include new people into a circle of friends or conversation. Coffee shop is a great place for that. When somebody new comes in with their coffee card, I see so many people go over and start talking, and um, Michelle's not here, she's serving in children's church today, but she's a great person to see new people and to go connect and to start talking, and, and what do you do? Let's go in the coffee shop and continuing a conversation. Um, so we all need to be sure that we're reaching, reaching out. Now, I know if some of you saw Michelle's personality test results on Facebook this week, she, first letter, the big E. She's an extrovert. So all of us can say, oh, well, we'll just leave that to all the extroverts in church. I'm, I'm an introvert. That's really uncomfortable for me. Get over yourself. Get out of your comfort zone. I mean, Jesus could have been an introvert, but he could have been an extrovert. But guess what? He did both. He functioned in both. You can do it. You can step out and be extroverted when you want. I've had some people say, I'm an introvert, but when I get around people I know, I feel so much more free that then I actually almost feel kind of extroverted. Well, if you can feel extroverted at times, you can feel extroverted whenever your will chooses. So for all of us, we can't just rely on the Zaras, the Marys, and the Michelles <laughs> to connect with every new person that walks into the church. We all have a part to play. The new person that comes in might be an introverted person. And to have Mary, the extreme extrovert, come and talk to them may be somewhat overwhelming. <laughs> but it, if Cindy could go over and connect with them, being a little more, you know, perhaps introverted and quiet, she might be the perfect fit that God has designed. All right? So all of us need to remember that. We can step outside of ourselves to connect. Okay, now I forgot where I am here. So uh, we need to be able to celebrate and appreciate the gifts in other people. Do our conversation and actions communicate? So are we like, or are we like, or to people? In our hearts, in our spirits, we need to embrace everyone. Everyone has a gift from the Lord. Everyone has a gift. Yes, some of their things that they do, their quirky behaviors or whatever, might kind of, you know, repel you and push you off. But receive them. They have a gift from God inside of them. You can be a friendly, generous receptor to a visitor coming into Zion, and that will help us build community. Last week, I talked about the phrase in Acts 2.46 where it stated that the people broke bread together in their homes, and the New American Standard actually says, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. And I talked about hearing that house-to-house -house part, meaning that it didn't always fall on the same person, like the same person didn't have to play host every time, and talked about, you know, we, we get too hung up on having this lovely exotic meal or whatever, and that the key is just getting together. It's not like you have to serve them chicken cordon bleu, that simple macaroni and cheese might just be the ticket. So uh, the message puts it this way. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal, a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw, and every day their number grew as God added to those who were saved. So to me, it looks like eating together is really the key. Inviting people to your home for a meal is awesome. Remember, it doesn't have to be fancy. 
My phone number is, no, I'm kidding. It's okay to share in the food. You don't have, I mean, you can say, hey, can you come over for dinner? Would you mind bringing a salad? I don't mind at all when people, in fact, I try to say, is there something that you would like me to bring? It's okay to do that. Take some of the pressure off. The point is getting together, not trying to look like I am the all-sufficient one. <clears throat> because eating together in the Acts 242 groups, whether it was to share a meal or dessert or to have communion together, it means and speaks family. People are just more real and relaxed when they're with family. So when you sit down a meal together, you feel like family. And then some of the blockages and the things that our defenses are up, they start to come down as you start to feel com comfortable and eat with one another. Um, we just, when we finished off our blast year this last June, we had a family potluck to finish it off. And the kids said it was their favorite time of all because they got to come together and they got to eat with their friends. They loved it. And because we feel very strongly that food and fellowship are vital to building community, I'm excited to tell you that on Friday night, the leadership team voted unanimously, well, James and Nicole are gone, but unanimously without them, um, to purchase new tables. We're going to get those lifetime, lightweight tables from Costco to replace our dilapidated, broken, multi tiered, leveled, heavy, heavy, heavy. All the youth who have moved them. I just know because whenever I ask my son to get one of those tables out for blast, he's like, Mom, do you really need it? It's so heavy. Uh, not that he's not incredibly strong. Yeah. <laughs> He's really strong and perfectly capable of moving those. But I must admit that because our tables are so ugly, so broken, you can't even line them up. You know, you try to put a tablecloth on it and it's like, <laughs> um, that it's been a deterrent. It's like everybody doesn't, we don't want to have to set the tables up to have fellowship meals together. That's wrong. I mean, it's a lot of work. So out with the old in with the new, and we're going to start eating together and having fellowship times. The debut of the new tables will be, Brad and Tori, I told them I would plug this, December 6th at our youth group fundraiser spaghetti feed, we will have our brand new tables so that the young people will not have to strain themselves to work that out, and they'll be able to cover the tables. I think last year they wanted to cover the tables with white paper like they do at Tomato Street, but when they rolled the paper out and it went, and then, you know, then they changed their minds and went to tablecloths. So we'll be excited. So that is a very tangible step in building community. We're going to begin to eat together more. Um, verses 15 and 16, laugh with your happy friends when they're happy and share tears when they're sad or down. Share in life with people, celebrate together, rejoice together, and mourn together. Come alongside one another and share the emotions of life. Then it says, get along with each other, don't be stuck up. That was a really, I don't know if the young people still say that. Is that still, like, it was really big when I was in high school to say so-and-so was stuck up. I don't know if it's still the phrase, the author probably is my age because uh, he said that somebody was stuck up. But that was often the way we referred to people that were, you know, stuck up. So <laughs> don't, uh, it says make friends with nobody, don't be the great somebody. Again, practice humility. Reach out to the lonely. Get along with each other. In 2 Corinthians 12, through 20, it says, um, it hits a few of our sins on the head, so I want to go there. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish. All right, everyone, get ready, because you, you're going to know some of these. Because we're a group of people, and they're there at times. And perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, Brian's looking around. <laughs> see, who's, see who's got a nervous tick. Um, anger, hostility, 
slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. To truly build community in our house, we have to guard against these dynamics that have an unfortunate way of creeping into any group. The enemy will use any tactic to bring division. We have to be on our guard. We have to be willing to go through self-examination and ask, how are we doing? Are we growing? Are we healthy? Have any of these community destroyers moved into our midst? Are they in mini form or are they in full-blown takeover? We have to apply the same diligence that they had in Acts 2.42. I talked about last week how they were diligent to, to be in the word and diligent to have fellowship and diligent to do. We need to have the same diligence in saying, you know, I smell quarreling. We, you know, this needs to be dealt with or... I know there's slander, you know, you know, you know like in, uh, that, that's one of my favorite scenes in, in Lord of the Rings when the guy's like, I smell man flesh, that scene. So, so, so we need to be keen in de deter to finding those things and ridding them uh, from our midst. Zion must be a safe place. Safe places are what allow for healing to take place. Zion has received words over decades that she would be a hospital, a place of healing. Where there is community, there is safety. And where there is safety, there is healing. So we have to pursue being a safe place. People need to be free to be themselves without fear of mockery, slander, or gossip. We want people to be open and honest and vulnerable. There's a desired snowball effect that comes from vulnerability. When I'm transparent and vulnerable, then Telena will be with me when we're sharing. And so there's a snowball effect that comes. So we need to be accepting. Um, gossip is like a weed that grows and overtakes a living thing. Young people, I felt a specific caution from the Lord. Because sometimes as we go through our junior high teenage years, we battle with insecurity and oftentimes the way that that manifests itself is gossiping about someone else. If you can make less of somebody else, then you'll maybe feel better about yourself and saying things. And so I caution you that gossip can be a terrible destroyer in a youth group. I mean, it can be a terrible destroyer in any group. But as I was preparing my notes, I just felt like God said, caution the young people. Guard your lips. Um, you're trying to build community. You're trying to establish young people together into becoming a group. You're a group within a group. And a uh, key divisiveness for you, I feel like, in any season could be that spirit of gossip that wants to come in. And so what do you, how do you deal with gossip? When somebody starts to gossip, be a friend, be loving, call them. Let's, hey, let's change our conversation. This isn't going in a good place. Or, um, you know, let's not, let's not gossip. When, I mean, if you love one another, you can take correction from one another, okay? So I'm, just, I'm looking right there because there's a whole row of them. So um, anyway, in love, that was the Lord's caution, guard, guard against gossiping. To, a, to get a greater cohesiveness in the youth group. Verses 17 and 19, don't hit back, discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in it, in you, get along with everyone. We need to learn how to solve conflicts graciously and gracefully. We have to be full of grace as we deal with one another. You can read the guidelines for how to solve a conflict in Matthew 18. We've all read that portion, but how many of us truly adhere to them? There is an overwhelming temptation to complain to our friends when someone has hurt us or made us angry. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Did you get that part? Between you and him or her. <laughs> Lauren, 
alone. If he listens to you, you will have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or more witnesses. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Hopefully never that it goes that far. And if he refuses to listen even then to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector, meaning that you end up treating that person as an unsaved individual. Where we often err is going to two or three brothers and complaining about what so-and-so did to us. And while we're trying to garner our own support and trying to get our friends to take our side, not good. A wise friend would say to you, you know, you really should go and talk to so-and-so about this. So take time to pray and ask for the Lord's perspective when you're hurt. Sometimes it's just a hurt or a problem that you have blown out of proportion. Allow the Lord to lead you because sometimes it just needs to be dealt with here, not this way. So talk to the Lord, deal with it, and then follow the steps in working out your problems. Always pray together for the Lord's guidance and wisdom in every situation. See the beauty in everybody. Look for God's deposit in each person's life. Again, everyone has a gift. Everyone is a child of God. They have a piece of the Father in them. Look for it. I think that perhaps many of you were expecting me to come up here today. Even some of you have made comments and said, oh, like, because I'm a more detail, you know, like, okay, first we're going to have on November 2nd, we're going to do this, and then at Thanksgiving time, we will do this, and having a list of things that is going to build community. But instead, I felt like God was calling each of us to check our own heart condition, because our heart condition will affect not only ourselves, but it will have a really a real and visible impact on the perceived and real community of Zion. So I've got, um, we'll see if this will work for me. So we're going to go through the letters really quickly. I think you'll find the spelling. Of, you'll work it out. So C, community celebrates and cares. O, we will have openness and transparency. We will model the love of Christ for M. Another M, I think you see what the word is spelling. Most of you are clever. I've been speaking the word a lot, so you should probably catch up by now. This is the one that Brian Fry is going to shoot up a hallelujah to, if it will come. Uh, meals should be shared. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> you, we need to have unity. That comes when we are inclusive when we are accepting, when we see the gift of God in one another, and when we learn how to solve problems and conflicts in a biblical fashion. N, we need, we need to meet the needs of others. I, identity. We know who we are in Christ, so we can reflect him to others. T. We trust in the Lord and establish, establish trust with one another. We walk in thankfulness. And last of all, why? A key to community. You. You. You are an important piece to the picture of community in Zion. Everybody, you all have a role to fulfill. So as I was preparing this, I read an article that was actually from an excerpt from a book by Scott uh, Peck, 
MD, who, for some of you, he wrote The Road Less Traveled. And so the whole time I'm reading this, well, I won't go there. I'll just tell you at the end. So the chapter was called The True Meaning of Com Com Community from the Different Drum. And I was excited when I started reading it. It was one of the last things that I read as I was putting together um, my message. He started talking about points for community, which were already points that I had written down. And you know when you're preparing a message, it's always really great to feel confirmed. I mean, I felt confirmed in the Lord, but then you start thinking, hmm. So that was exciting. Then the last section of his chapter got really exciting for me, and I hope it will inspire you as well as I read it. He said, the spirit of true community is the spirit of peace. He goes on to say, but, but spirit is slippery. It does not submit itself to definition to capture the way material things do. So it is that a group and community does not always feel peaceful in the usual sense of the word. Its members will from time to time struggle with each other, with each other and struggle hard. The struggle may become excited and exuberant with little if any room for silence, but it is a productive not destructive struggle. It always moves towards consensus because it is always a loving struggle. It takes place on the ground of love. The spirit of community is inevitably the spirit of peace and love. The atmosphere of love and peace are so palpable that almost every community member experiences it as a spirit. In the latter form of reference, the spirit of community is not envisioned as a purely human spirit or one created solely by the group. It is assumed to be external to and independent of the group. If therefore, it therefore is thought of as descending upon the group, just as the Holy Spirit is said to have descended upon Jesus at his baptism in the form of a dove. This does not mean, however, that the Spirit's visitation is accidental or unpredictable. It can fall upon and take root only in fertile and prepared ground. Thus, for those of Christian orientation, the work of human building is seen as preparation for the descent of the Holy Spirit. So this is where I started getting excited because the whole time I'm reading it, and I knew he had written a lot of books that actually have a lot of um, popularity in more the secular tract. He's written, yeah, <laughs> David Burnett's like, oh, yeah. And so I, when I started, so I was thinking all the time, I'm reading this and thinking, oh, but, you know, he's probably not even from a Christian thing. And then he starts in with all of this, and it gets really awesome. Uh, for those of the Christian orientation, the working of community building is seen as the preparation of the descent of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of community is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. That's when I like, whoa. So this part is me. So consider the scripture in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 9, where it says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. That state of peace is the sign of his family. We are sons of God. The peace and being sons of God are related. That's awesome. Peacemaking is the birthright and birth assignment of God's sons and daughters. A peacemaker gives up his perceived rights as he seeks a path of advancing harmony among individuals, families, and nations so that everyone experiences the Father's love. We must partner with the Holy Spirit to be empowered to act as his peacemakers on the earth. So now back to the concluding portion of Dr. Peck's passage. My own frame of reference is Christian. So I'm like, oh, okay. And for me, therefore, the spirit of community, which is the presence of peace and love, is also the spirit of Jesus. But the Christian understanding of community would go even beyond this. The doctrine of the Trinity, of the three in one, holds that Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, while separate in one sense, are the same in another. So when I talk of Jesus being present in community, I'm also speaking of the presence of God and the Holy Spirit. In Christian thought, the Holy Spirit is particularly identified with wisdom. Wisdom is envisioned as a kind of revelation. To the secular mind, we humans, through thought, study, and, assimil and through assimilation of experience, arrive at wisdom. It is our own achievement. 
we somehow earn it, while Christian thinkers hardly denigrate the value of thought, study, and experience, they believe that something more is involved in the creation of wisdom. Specifically, they believe wisdom to be a gift of God and the Holy Spirit. The wisdom of true community often seems miraculous. This wisdom can perhaps be explained in purely secular terms as a result of the freedom of expression, the pluralistic talents, the consensual decision-making that occur in community. There are times, however, when this wisdom to be, excuse me, when this wisdom seems to be more a matter of divine spirit and possible divine intervention. This is one of the reasons why the feeling of joy is such a frequent concomitant, which also means natural accompaniment, to the spirit of community. The feeling of joy is a natural accompaniment to the spirit of community. The members feel that they have temporarily, at least partially, been transferred or transported out of the mundane world of ordinary preoccupations, and for the moment, this is the phrase that got me, for the moment is, is as if heaven and earth had somehow met when he talks about community. So needless to say, when I read that last paragraph, I got super excited because it put into words what I felt like the Lord was saying. When we build a true community and have that sense here at Zion, it will be a representation of heaven on earth. And that sounds incredible to me. I want us to have a more cohesive sense of community that when people walk in, they feel the love, they feel the peace, they see that connection between heaven and earth. Can you guys um, stand up and hold hands with your neighbor and across the aisles? All right. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Father, we thank you. And we come before you today hungry and expectant for the things that you want to do here in our midst, Lord God. We open our hearts up, Lord God, to receive all that you have for us. Lord, the word has come to build community. And today, Father, we stand before you as a group of people that do indeed welcome you into our building experience. Lord, be the architect, be the contractor, be the one that's running this project, Lord. Father, we don't want it to come from human endeavor. We don't want a list of things that we say we can do. Um, in, in our own fleshly form to build community. But Lord God, we want to take the things, the words that you speak, and Lord, begin to see community being built. Lord, we want to experience the love of you, your love, Lord God, in each person's life. And Father, I pray right now that anyone that has a diminished understanding of how much you love them, Lord, right now that you would come and touch them with a great revelation of your love. Father's love, come and sweep into this room. Lord God, we know that your love is resident in each one of us. We know that you're there. But Lord, we take that chance to look into the mirror today and see you in us, to see your love in us. Lord, we want to be open and transparent with others. We want to model your love. We want to be a people that are in unity. Lord God, teach us, equip us, give us wisdom in solving conflicts one with another. Lord, because we know as we solve conflicts that we'll be building strength. That doesn't mean that we're not ever going to not get along. Lord, we know that there's going to be arguments and frustrations and hurts that come. But Lord, let us in love work towards solving those full of your grace, Lord God, full of your compassion and understanding. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we all want to trust in you and we want to be able to trust 
one another. Lord, I know the scripture says, trust in God, don't trust in man. But Lord, in community, there is a trust that is established. And so today, Father, I just call for trust in one another to be established. Lord God, kindle the fire that would cause each of us to be united and believing in one another. Lord, we pray right now when we just break off any of those um, things that would come against to destroy if there be any spirit of hostility or anger or malice, if there be a spirit of gossip in the house right now, today, in Jesus' name, we command those things to be broken. And we each take personal responsibility to cut those things short when we see them in our own lives. Lord God, cause us to be people that walk in your way. We want to be a reflection of you to everyone that comes in, but especially to our brothers and sisters in the house. Lord God, we thank you for each and every person and for the gift inside of each and every one. Lord, I pray that you would open our spiritual eyes that when we look on one another, we would see the Jesus inside that person that we would call Jesus out, that we would speak into the gifts that we see and begin to draw them out where they could become useful vessels. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you for the work that you're doing. And we say, Lord, we open ourselves to you. And Lord, we first of all put ourselves on the examination table and we say, Lord, where do I need to buff myself up? Where do I need to shine myself? Where do I need to release things? Where do I need to let go of hurts? Lord God, start with me. I know the key for building community is start with me. And so, Lord God, touch my heart. Change me. When I feel introverted, help me step out. Help me connect with people. Help me be hospitable and warm. I want to be a friendly and generous and welcoming receptor into this house. Lord, we love you, and we know that you love us, and that a loving Father does come and bring discipline and chastisement and the things that we need, but all of those things work for our good. And so today, Lord God, we embrace any correction that you bring to us. And Father, we're excited for the times ahead. We're excited for, as we build community, Lord, we're excited for the outreach that's going to come from this house. When we're confident in who you have established us to be, we can go out and be so much more effective in our community and in our city. We thank you, Lord God. We worship you today. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Boy, that was awesome. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> I do have to say that I was excited when she said that we would be eating more together. I can just imagine the smell of, you know, sausage and bacon cooking, filling the area more. <clears throat> and I imagine if we could uh, smell the Holy Spirit, he would probably smell something like bacon. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but I do want to, uh... I just tag on to what uh, Chris was saying about gossip, and that's something that uh, it can be so uh, poisonous and uh, create such a wedge. And um, I know us as believers, we can call it different things, but if we're talking to somebody other than the person that we need to to correct the situation, then that's considered gossip, and there's no place for it. But, uh, you know, we're, we're all imperfect. We're, you know, some of us are quiet, some of us talk a lot, but, uh, you know, and no matter what our background, God delights in each one of us, and it's his heart for us to be able to delight in each other. And so just as we're going out this week, just uh, take opportunities to delight in the people around you in uh, God's creation and just to get to get to know them a little bit more. So uh, be blessed and uh, just love you guys. So.